Tech is a bi-weekly podcast exploring the intersections of technology and ministry. It is part of the podcast network sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Our show today is hosted by Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Welcome back to Wells Tech, everybody. This is episode 679. We're recording it on August, April 21st, 2022. Show about technology and ministry and where those two intersect. And alongside, as usual, from Mankato, Minnesota, Sally Draper. Hello, Sally Draper. Hi, Martin. Happy to be joining you. Last time we recorded, I was sitting in your office recording, but this time I'm in my home office Back in Mankato, mm-hmm. and I'm really not wanting you to skip summer and get us all the way to August. I'm looking summer, forward to We haven't even have spring yet. So. <laughs> right, right. As a matter of fact, um, we just had Easter and kind of basking in that Easter afterglow. I don't know about you, Martin, but Easter worship is just a highlight of the whole year. Um, This was our first Easter here in Mankato at St. Paul's in North Mankato. And our congregation is blessed with probably at least a 20 person orchestra that plays on special occasions. So yeah, full strings, including a harp. We have timpani, we have brass, we have saxophones and it's, it's really, uh, Talk about rejoicing. There was some beautiful music happening. So that, that's a neat thing. Yeah. Good stuff. Good to see every seat filled. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you might remember last year, not the case. I think very few of us were even in the building. Um, right. Mid COVID. So this was extra special. For sure. Um, speaking of extra special, uh, we have another great interview. It seems like we've had just a, a nice run of, of great people to talk to. And uh, this is an old friend, uh, Pastor James Baring, Baringer from the Center for Mission and Ministry. And uh, he heads up our special ministries group, uh, probably the, the most sprawling of all <laughs> our areas of ministries. Um, they have their fingers in a lot of different things. There's so many opportunities for ministry in special ministries. And our uh, interest in talking with uh, Pastor Beringer was the use of technology specific to prison ministry. And he has some real needs there as that uh, technology is changing or the ways they can minister to prisoners is, is changing through the use of technology. So they're trying to stay up with the changes and they're looking for help. So uh, that was kind of the subject of the interview amongst other things. So let's take a listen or a view of that interview with uh, Pastor James Beringer. We're happy to welcome Pastor James Beringer from Wells Special Ministries to uh, joining the show today. Really appreciate you being here, Jim. Thank you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things going on in special ministries and some of the unique needs you have, especially in the area of technology. Uh, but before we do that, maybe give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, what you do for Wells, and a little bit about your background. Okay. Yeah, I find a lot of people hear the word special ministries and they think of developmental disabilities, but Basically, we are helping congregations watch for the person for whom the normal way of doing things doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And we try to help them think through that and come up with a resource or an answer to to solve that problem. And my my role is really at uh, at the national level is to make people aware of things and to recruit people for that and then do administration. But most of the work we're doing is always to equip local congregations. Mm -hmm. How many areas of special ministries are there? Well, uh, we, on how you count them yeah, right, right, yeah, right. We do subcommittees now, yeah. so we can say we only have 13 teams. So it's just like, <laughs> 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 but yeah, there's always something coming up, and uh, so it's yeah. There's eight divisions, but like under mental health, there's there's one for pornography and one for uh, sexual abuse, and and then there's uh, recovery groups. So there's all these things under those eight. Mm-hmm. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, we want to focus to start with, at least, on prison ministry. We understand that COVID and all the changes around 
um, access to prisoners has really had a huge impact. And so um, what kind of challenges are there? Tell us uh, what's going on in prison ministry. Like a lot of things with COVID, it's a mixed bag because in some ways it was a real blessing. Um, when lockdown happened and people could not access the inmates, uh, uh, th we called the prisons and they ordered lots of our books and there was a huge bubble that year of, of demand for our, our studies because our studies are individual. Each person teaches themselves as they work through a Bible study. And so they don't need to have a classroom and a teacher and all that. So it was you know, really a great year that way. But at the same time that that was going on, another thing is happening in the correctional system across the country, and that is a movement away from the United States mail and from paper. And those are the two things that we really depend heavily on. And in that area, uh, the, the things that are happening there are, are twofold. One is a concern for, for uh, drug, uh, drugs coming in. They can come in on paper. So they're trying to eliminate that as a, as a possibility. And then they're also trying to cut back on the cost of all the sorting and delivering of mail internally to the institution. Mm -hmm. And so they're moving away from that. But when they do, of course, they have to always look at security. And that's where we're running into trouble. So for years, we've protected the identities of our pen pals by having them use our prison ministry mailbox. And we have a sorting system in, at our office. And the mail comes in from the inmates and goes to the right pen pal, and nobody knows uh, where, the, where they are. But now with the new system, you have to be the name on the account. And it has to be your credit card that's used to pay for it. And suddenly, you know, everything is in the privacy is a problem on, on that score. And on the bigger issue for us is our, bar, our Bible studies, which have been such a big blessing and is a unique niche. There's no other religious group that's doing the self-study thing. Everybody depends on doing a, um, a cl in-person cl class or now on Zoom, but you can only have 20 people at a time instead of mailing out to hundreds. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they've tightened down the system, they've not allowed for publications like ours, and, and we're off the radar. There's probably eight electronic companies that are dealing with the correctional facilities across the country right now, but they're all answering questions of big corporations, and we're pretty small potatoes uh, in comparison. So we've had one that, that uh, ha ha has talked to us and worked with us, but even there, we find that on the, on the correctional side of it, they don't necessarily understand what we've agreed to on the corporate side. So it's been a real problem and, and we have to crack that nut. Now I, I mentioned there's positive things and that uh, here in Wisconsin, the three districts of Wisconsin uh, are served in correctional ministry by institutional ministries. And they took the, the one email system that's here and it's 10 cents a email and they've been emailing devotions out and they, they've discovered very rapid response. You know, when you send a letter, they have to read it, respond, and it goes back in the mail, and it's a very slow process. But now when you get emails, suddenly the inmate can just hit, I've got a question, and the question comes back. So uh, that, that makes us excited, too, that if we can get our Bible study material in a digital form that's accessible to correctional facilities, mm -hmm. this could be a really wonderful thing for the future. And we have, we have so many resources to convert. Sure. So as you look a year out, five years out, what what do you hope to see? How do you how do you envision yourself functioning, meeting the needs of, of these of these prisoners going forward, using the tools? And it's probably different from state to state or institution to institution as well. What's the best case scenario for you? What do you what do you need? Well, we need to be able to have a product that's accessible in all these different areas with all the different rules. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it truly is institutional specific. So here in Wisconsin, we thought we had it solved, but then we find no, that the local chaplain or the local warden sure. still makes rules. And so to have something that's just like an email considered safe, and they can look at it so they mm -hmm. can be sure it's safe, um, but that we can just simply provide the material and they can respond to it, uh, just like they do right. with mail. Uh, to, but that there's lots of things to get over that obstacle. Okay. But you really need somebody's focused attention, right? You yes. know, somebody who has a passion for it, and uh, you know, describe what that, you know, how that might that person might help your ministry. Yeah. So we have a, a really great team, but we need 
um, uh, some people that can uh, talk to the people directly that are making these decisions. So that takes a little bit of a knack to, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to find the right person to talk to and present our case. And so this is somewhat of a very specialized thing um, that uh, with people skills, I suppose. Then technology-wise, of course, there's the other thing of how do we convert our, our stuff to mm -hmm. something simple that can be re responsive. Okay. So yeah, we have that technology need too of somebody who can maybe help us develop something, but right now we don't know the parameters of what mm -hmm. that would be. So it looks like you've got some needs on a couple different fronts, yes. uh, but really somebody who has a heart for it and the, you know, the desire to help out. So yeah. I would assume that they could contact your office and, mm -hmm. uh, and figure out what the specific needs are and where they could uh, uh, help you out. Yeah, we've, been able, we've already gotten some people to come and, and they are calling the wardens you know, so we're doing that, but this is a higher level thing, and uh, and then the technology side of it still left. Kind of overall, the plan level. You yes. know, somebody who's who can uh, keep all the cards straight and and uh, pursue opportunities. Right. And volunteers obviously are part of all of those eight areas slash thirteen areas that mm -hmm. you support in special ministries. How what is it like to be a volunteer? Are you engaged in in meetings? You know kind of across the nation thing? Do your committees get together pretty regularly? And So, well, the committee level, a lot of that's done by Zoom these days, okay. you know. Uh, one of our ministries, uh, is, uh, the Mission for the Visually Impaired, has a workshop in the Twin Cities, and uh, they have a group of volunteers that get together and process all the things that hmm. still go out by mail and come in, and um, and they, they do some editing and things there in that office. But otherwise, a lot of this has gone to, you can do it at, in home now. That's great. And um, we, we communicate then with our volunteers at, in the home. And that's been a, uh, a convenience. And also, um, it's just with, with the internet, uh, I'm, I'm training somebody on Tuesdays, you know, for several weeks in a row to get them up and running on their job. And, mm -hmm. and then they can carry that forward. And I don't, mm -hmm have to be there and they don't have to travel somewhere and they, they can do it in their time and their convenience. What a unique opportunity to be part of real ministry efforts that are going on across the whole nation and we're talking specifically prison ministry but I would assume there's other volunteer opportunities in special ministries as well. Yeah, some really important ones. One I say always say if you like playing solitaire on the computer, <laughs> <laughs> I've got the job for you. <laughs> so. Uh, there's something called Amazon Polly. Uh, Forwarding Christ uses it on their website to, to have audio articles. And we just, we take a book in uh, Word format and you just cut and paste it into Amazon Polly and you have to do a little bit of formatting, but then it comes out as, a, as an audio book. Oh, and nice. so that's, that's one of the things we have. And then another one, we do have a lot of readers, people, uh, Wells members who are reading books but we have a bottleneck because we don't have very many people who are willing to use the software. It's not a difficult software, it's just tedious. And so it's, again, this, the, the, the solitaire model, mm -hmm. if you will, that taking the sound, listening to it, and cutting out the, the error and producing a, a, a book out of that. And again, that can be done at your own speed, at your own home. Sure. So it sounds a, a lot like a lot of our paper, I'm a fan of paper, I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but a lot of our paper resources converting them to digital. Yeah. Things, uh, making audio recordings of books that we have and uh, making the computer read the books that we have. So a lot of digitizing. Yeah. So that's fun and, and actually a pretty good skill to learn in today's mm -hmm. environment. And we're willing to teach people to do it. So that's, yeah. that's It's just going to become more and more common, I think, as time goes on. I, we still you know, are focused on encouraging people to be involved in their own church and their own community, whether it's taking the training to prevent sexual abuse in your congregation, all the way over to uh, teaching a Sunday school for a child with developmental disabilities. You know, there's, there's just a, a large number of things. Uh, I, these days I've been helping people with a disability to actually serve in their congregation. Mm -hmm. And that's been fun. Sure that's needs. been really fun. Uh, had a young man who has some autistic things in his background, but persistence is a very lacking 
quality these days and he's got persistence <laughs> and wow we've done some wonderful things because of his involvement so yeah my congregation has a young man with down syndrome that ushers every single sunday he's there it's really neat to see you want to see a friendly face yeah you know? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Right. Yeah. So, Jim, if somebody wanted to learn more about special ministries, whether they be volunteer opportunities or contributing or praying for, they go to the website, I'm assuming? You, yeah, you can find a lot of things on the website if you go to wells.net uh, backslash and special hyphen ministries, and then pay attention to the right column where all the ministries are listed. Okay. So there's an article here about us, but look at that column, you can click around and, you know, just there's articles, there's lots of things there. Sure. And then the other thing is that we now have a twice monthly newsletter going out okay. in e-news and it has one feature article and then sometimes it'll have other things down below that'll be promoting. On that same page, I'm assuming they can find mm -hmm. that. Oh, uh, well, it, actually, we should probably put we something there. So. Yeah, <laughs> telling people to subscribe over people. here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything exciting coming up in special ministries you want to share or promote? Yeah, I think that uh, people are going to really love a new Bible class that's going to roll out this summer called Helping Hurting People with Hope. Uh, it, it, it was originally written to help re people who are returning from incarceration, but that's a pretty narrow profile of mm -hmm. people. But we realized that the kind of thinking that's involved and the kind of, of grace uh, for other people that uh, it's needed for everybody who has a struggle, especially the kind of struggle where you might think, that person got into their own trouble, they did something that caused their trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people step back from that instead of saying, here we have somebody like Zacchaeus up in the tree who needs, uh, who's coming to us for help, is looking for Christian support and love. And this is exactly our niche, you know. Mm -hmm. So that Bible class helps people see people differently and then know well, how to do. And then uh, we're doing other things too, like we've rolled out the mentoring class for prison ministry and uh, so that people can help returning citizens. We have um, coming up, we're training uh, military contact pastors this month. Uh, and that's always exciting to, to meet with them and talk about military ministry and go on a base. And, and a lot of that material will be seen in a Wells Connection okay. this fall. So, Excellent. yeah. And then uh, we had a lot of response this last month to, we're offering looping grants, grants to congregations that consider putting a hearing loop in their church. And uh, uh, that has really drawn a lot of interest from congregations. Wonderful. Nice. Good. Very good. Jim, thanks so much for taking some time. Blessings on your continuing work and your search for, for volunteers, and especially in this area of prison ministry. Such important work, uh, but some, some challenges and opportunities, certainly. So thank you for joining us. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time uh, and uh, talking us through, again, all the great opportunities, um, volunteer or otherwise, within special ministries. It, uh, the, that guy has a lot on his plate. Absolutely. It is neat to consider um, how you can volunteer and be a really important piece of the puzzle. And, you know, sometimes it seems kind of far away that, yeah, they're doing prison ministry or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a way to use your gifts. And in this day and age, do it from wherever you're located, using the internet and uh, connecting. I know Pastor Berenger has it well organized with all the different volunteers he works with. So there's definitely uh, ways where you can fit into the puzzle. So uh, check out their website. We'll have a link in the show notes and uh, all the different resources they provide there, um, newsletters and things like that. And then opportunities, as we said, to volunteer are going to be available from there as well. So check it out. Yeah, it's very easy to have a great kingdom impact um, just by raising your hand saying, yeah, I can do this or how can I, how can I help? And I think that's what they're looking for, just willing people passionate about ministry in whatever area, whether it's prison or otherwise, there's so many opportunities to serve there. So yeah, get involved. It, would, it would probably be a neat thing, Martin, for us to just volu um, poll volunteers kind of centered wide, because I think what we would get in response is how blessed they are by doing the volunteering, how God uses sure. it to enhance their lives and things. So um, always uh, a neat thing to consider. Yeah. Thanks again, Jim, for taking some time with us. All right, let's move on to ministry resources. 
Yeah. And today we want to uh, kind of shine a spotlight on a conference that's coming up this summer from the Wells Women's Ministry area. They have a conference ever so often. I believe their last one maybe was in 2019. And uh, they are planning one for this summer, July 21st through 23rd at Luther Prep School in Watertown, Wisconsin. That's where their last conference was held. And I was I was blessed to attend that. So I'm, um, you know, giving you firsthand experience that this conference is well worth your time. It is it is just a wonderfully organized, um, very scripture based. So this time they've chosen the book of Ephesians and the theme of one W-O-N, to be one, O-N-E. And it's about diversity and uh, the different um, ways that our world is kind of shattered right now, but how we have unity um, through God's word and truth in scripture and getting along and doing that in a graceful way for ourselves and others. So looks to be a wonderful topic. They have a great list of speakers lined up, activities on Friday and Saturday. Um, let's see, I have kind of a rundown of speakers. They have Paul Winland, um, Pastor Ben Kratz, uh, Don Schultz, who's been a leader in the women's ministry area for many, um, many years, and I've heard her speak before, really wonderful. A district president from Michigan, Snowden, Snowden Sims, is speaking, as well as Ryan Colander, who does uh, mission work in the Detroit area. I think Ryan's wife is coming along and speaking as well. Um, and then finally, wrapping up the headliner speakers is Ting Ting Schwartz, who is a professor at MLC, a cross-cultural uh, person herself. She's from China, and she just brings um, amazing insight into ministry opportunities across cultures. So um, worth your time and uh, very well done. I can guarantee it. Um, and so look forward to that conference coming up July 21st through 23rd. We'll have information in the show notes at wellstech.wells.net about how you can get registered. Yeah. Make sure you get that on your websites and make sure your ladies uh, in your congregations are, are informed that that's happening. Um, my daughter attended, uh, wasn't last, wasn't last year. Wasn't yeah. It was two years ago. I think it was three years ago. Three in years ago, yeah, yeah. probably, um, and, and had an awesome time. So very mm-hmm. enriching. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on to our picks of the week. Yeah, and I have a cool pick. I was excited to get notified from our friends at Common Sense Media about a whole new area, a whole new set of media that they're reviewing and making available, and it's podcast reviews. How about that? Um, if you aren't familiar with Common Sense Media, they basically review things like movies and television and books and video games, all kinds of different things um, where media is being produced, particularly targeting uh, children. And uh, their reviews are always really well organized. Um, you can break it down by different um, genres and ages and things like that. And that's true also of this new section of podcast reviews they've added. So these are podcasts that are targeting kids topics um, and they have them organized in a lot of different ways. And again, by age category, they've also added a best of best podcasts, their recommendations for families. And that's organized again, filterable by age, but then you can get things like great podcasts to listen to as a family or kids podcasts that promote learning or fun podcasts for curious kids, just all different categories that they've organized things under. And then once you drill into a particular category, there's a whole list and that's when you can filter it more um, by age group or whatever and find out what's available for different ages. And um, I don't know about you, Martin, if you can remember back those days, or if you've traveled with your grandkids recently, but it was always kind of a fun thing when our family would travel with our young children to have some cool audio to listen to along the way. We often made these long treks from the North to the South and had many, many hours cooped up in the car and audio was something we looked forward to uh, books or whatever. And so um, having a list of podcast to consider um, would be really fun for us, I would think. So check it out. I'm guessing the list is kind of narrow right now, but maybe over time, they'll be adding more and more to their podcast reviews list. And um, I definitely trust the source. Common Sense Media does an excellent job with their reviews and things. So check it out. 
Very nice. Um, yeah, we were riding around, oh, maybe three, four weekends ago with the grandkids and, and playing some podcasts. And that's uh, yeah, always great um, drive time kinds mm-hmm. of things. So if you can get mm-hmm. that ahead of time, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how Common Sense Media does it. They are, I'm sure, they seem certainly well-funded, but it's a nonprofit organization. And just the way they organize the content and present it, um, all free to us, mm-hmm. uh, just, a, just a nice opportunity to, to grab some good stuff. So thanks for bringing that back into the, to the uh, front stage here. Mm-hmm. All right, my pick of the week is actually a keyboard. Um, I've been, I've used lots of different keyboards, but I've never actually used what's called a gaming keyboard. These are typically wired keyboards and, um, you can typically tell a gaming keyboard because it has a couple of characteristics different from your average, you know, keyboard that you just pull off the shelf at Best Buy. One of them is they're actually usually very heavy, you know, they're well Mm -hmm. constructed, uh, and the keys have a very distinctive sound. There are different kinds of keys, and there's a whole industry now of gaming keyboards that allow you to craft them with different colored keys, keys that make different sounds, um, different configurations. Um, I like the sturdiness of it and the fact that it is wired. I've had some problems uh, with Bluetooth keyboards uh, in the past, losing connection or getting a little laggy. But I found that using a gaming keyboard, even though they're slightly more expensive, typically uh, uh, eliminates that. Very responsive. And I kind of like the clickety uh, sound of the <laughs> keys themselves. Um, and they have some cool lights on them. And there's there's all kinds of other features that you can get with some of these. The, the brand that I've and I don't have a lot of experience, but the one that I'm enjoying right now is from Logitech. Um, and this one actually is wired or wireless, which is kind of nice. If you want to detether, you can do that. Uh, and you can get these typically in three kinds of what they call um, keycaps or switches. Uh, one is called linear. One is called um, uh, tactile. And one is called clicky switches. And we'll include a guide uh, to what all those mean. I have the tactile one, which is kind of the moderately noisy one. Um, And uh, linear is the the little quieter one, which is probably what most people are used to with the traditional keyboard. And then the clicky one is obviously, you know, everybody in the room next door will be able (laughs) to hear you type one. Um, but there's something satisfying about that too. It almost it makes you feel more productive when you can hear yourself type. Um, but, uh, the keys are well-made. In fact, the whole, the, the whole kit is, is really, uh, made to last. And I've, I've really been enjoying the, the Logitech ones that, uh, holds this model that I've, that I've got here, but I think Logitech in general is kind of the leader in a lot of different areas in, in accessories or, um, uh, peripherals. You know, mice uh, use a Logitech mouse keyboard. The webcam that uh, we use is uh, is Logitech. They're kind of the, the leader in, in some of those spaces. So, uh, so if you're in the market for a new keyboard and you're kind of tired of fighting with uh, kind of the the low quality plasticky feel of of what you're spending a lot of your time touching uh, using, uh, take a look at uh, these Logitech gaming keyboards. It's not all exclusively for gamers so okay so inquiring what minds want to know not exclusively for gamers but are you martin spriggs a gamer not what's your in, favorite game not in the least <laughs> okay <laughs> well that just killed that line of questioning how about the colorful keyboard do you have it like flashing um mono you know the whole rainbow of colors i turned, or? I turned off the rainbow the, the, cy- the, the cycling of the colors <laughs> i picked a color which okay. I think was green and um, it matches the mouse color too. Cause it has a little glowing G on it as well. So you can configure that to your heart's content. One of the nice things about the, the Logitech keyboards and the mice is they're totally customizable. So if you want, uh, you know, the key cap or the, the key lock button to do something different, you can set that up as a macro or for you can configure all the buttons on the mouse to, to work together nicely with the key combinations. Um, so that's one of the nice things. And one of the other things I really, 
a lot of the keyboards today, uh, the bigger ones have the number pad on the right, which I, I detest, um, mm-hmm. just gets the mouse too far away from the keyboard. I like the, the mouse right next to the keyboard. So this one kind of compromises on that. So it doesn't have the key pad, but it does have the page down, page up, delete, home, and which I like. I don't like those shared with other keys on the keyboard. So it does have those on the right, but they're kind of tightly packed together. So it doesn't add too much width to the keyboard. So just don't like that that extra three, four inches taken up by the, the keypad, which I really never use. I'm fine using the, the top row of the keyboard. Yeah. I have a couple of geeky keyboard stories to share in relation oh to your pick. <laughs> um, the first one is my husband likes the Dvorak layout of yeah. keys. And most of these keyboards, the, the keycaps are detachable. So it's right. pretty easy to reorganize them into that Dvorak la- layout. So that maybe was one of his excuses for spending so much on a keyboard. Um, but interestingly, um, our son has a, a gaming keyboard. And as a challenge a project my husband actually carved keycaps for him out of wood using his cnc (laughs) machine so he designed keycaps just for the arrow keys so he has this this one set of keys that are this wood and it's really super cool he would love it if dad did the whole keyboard but i think that would be a huge undertaking, but anyway, yeah, there's lots of geeky things you can do with keyboards. Apparently that that's so cool. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a super, you know, big hobby right now for a lot of computer nerds maybe. Um, (laughs) But again, it's sitting right in front of you. It's a very personal thing. It's something Mm -hmm. you've uh, you use all the time. It's how you interact with your computer. If you're not using the keyboard on a laptop, which is sometimes I find kind of hard to type on as you're kind of navigating the trackpad and, you know, it's not, it's not elevated and, you know, it just it doesn't have that tactile feel. So. Well, very good. One thing I have to be careful of with this keyboard, if I'm podcasting with it is, you know, typing on it. So I know you sometimes <laughs> type notes and if I were to do that, then uh, you'd all hear it. So the world would know. Right. That's right. <laughs> all right. So that's my pick of the week. Uh, community news and feedback. We've got a couple things here that we wanted to uh, share. Pastor Phil Henslin uh, reached out with a couple of items that we felt were worth passing along. One had to do for, uh, with Zoom, you Zoom users, and I know there's more of you than there used to be. Um, there are some, uh, there's a whole extension or plugin uh, community. Marketplace. Marketplace, mm-hmm. right that uh, they call it the Zoom app marketplace that uh, has got all kinds of things in it. Some are free, some are uh, paid for. Uh, He was, uh, Phil was talking about one called Zoom or AI note taker by Fathom. And this is a transcriber. So it basically listens to your conversation and puts it down in print. Uh, it does a little bit more than that, and apparently it does a good job. I have not used this, so I can't vouch for it. But uh, just looking at the the advertisement for the plugin itself or for the app uh, looks pretty cool. Uh, it, so it takes the notes for you. So it's basically transcribing. But as you take the notes, you can highlight with different uh, keyboard commands or mouse clicks uh, what uh, you felt was relevant uh, so that you don't have to read through the, the entire transcript. Uh, so there's highlighting. I think you can customize that. Uh, and uh, they have a, an example here of action items, positive reactions, pain points, you know, just kind of little things that are going to be cues, visual cues for you to, to go right to that place within the, the notes that were taken. I think you can write your own notes, add your own notes to it. Uh, and then there's a whole sharing uh, uh, way to, to get these notes to other people, whether that be through Google Docs or email or Slack or Teams or something like that. And then a uh, full search engine, which is important if you're trying to search through your, your transcription. So the, this, is kind of, this is kind of a nice feature, especially if uh, you're in a lot of meetings and uh, you want to, to make sure that you're capturing uh, the contents of it in a, in a nicely consumable, reusable 
uh, repurposable format. So thank you, Phil, for uh, pointing us in that direction. And if anybody has experience with that, let us know. Uh, the other item that he shared was an article on uh, what is called browser in browser attacks. This is related to security. Uh, it's entitled a devastating new phishing technique arises. Everybody, I think most people know what phishing is, but this is a, a new form of that. Um, I'll just read a, a piece of, the, of the, one of the opening paragraphs. Browser in the browser attacks consist of simulating a browser window within the browser to spoof a legitimate domain. The attack takes advantage of third-party single sign-on options, which has become increasingly common for users to log into many different websites. You kind of know what that, uh, you, if you say log in with Google or log in with Microsoft or Apple, that's what they're talking about there. The principle is pretty straightforward. The user connects to a website, which in turn opens a new browser window that asks for Google, Apple, Microsoft, or other third-party credentials to allow the user to log in. This benefits the user because they don't need to remember or use an additional password to log into the website. That's where the BITB attack comes in. In a BITB attack, the user is being served a fraudulent pop-up window that will request their single sign-on password. The main difference from a usual phishing case lies in the fact that in addition to popping up that window, it can show any URL, including a legitimate one. So you can't really tell like you can in some of these other phishing attempts by looking at the URL that it's fake because they can mask uh, what URL it's coming from. So uh, this is uh, a growing concern. So just be sure, just take a double take when you're being asked to, to log in uh, with your you know, single sign-on accounts, Google or, or whatever it is, Facebook, Twitter, um, that it is the, what you expect it to be. So don't just quickly jump over that, but uh, be careful. You could be giving your credentials to somebody if you don't really want to have have it. Mm -hmm. so you know, Martin, you, when I get those options, I don't know about you, but I typically try to avoid signing in to another website with my Google or Apple or Facebook credentials or whatever. I usually go the old fashioned way and use my email address and mm. make an account. You're different that way. I, I always, wondered. I always use my Google. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. So I know that that's the. I'm all, all, if there's a choice, Google's almost always there. So I'll mm -hmm. almost always pick Google. Mm -hmm. And then if I change my Google password, then oh. uh, I've got a blanket um, uh, way to, to protect myself across those sites. I don't know if that's great security practice. I should ask our own Rob Benson whether that's a good practice or not. I believe it is. But um, you can also go into Google, which is kind of nice, and deauthorize all those mm -hmm. apps. So you can kind of see, you have a record of all the places that you've done that with. So that's just another double check. And right there, you can deauthorize those. So that's another fallback. Um, mm -hmm. Just a little bit of a time saver, but you know, the, the username and email address and password is good too, as long as you're creating strong passwords and you're using, and I assume you, you probably do use a tool like LastPass or something like that where it is generating one of those strong passwords for you and, re and okay. recording it too. So you don't forget it. Yeah, exactly. Um, another practice that I do security wise related to what you were just talking about, Martin, is I have a follow up then email set up that yeah. once a month I get an email that tells me to check my permissions. So it, I go mm. into, you know, it has the link to go into that Google area and just, you know, think about this for a minute. Hello, you're, mm -hmm. you've got these permissions out there. Do you still need all of these uh, apps and things authorized with your account? So yeah, it takes a bit of effort and thinking, and that's, that's interesting insight that you provided. I thought I was being probably a little more safe going Maybe with you are. Yeah. setting up the separate accounts. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Do your own Our, research. Don't trust. Yeah. Don't always trust us. <laughs> your mileage may vary. <laughs> All right. Um, a couple of other things in the community news and feedback section that we wanted to make mention of. And I will try to do this magically by sharing my screen once more. Um, one of them is from Michael Vlieger. 
who is a teacher at Risen Savior here in Mankato, Minnesota. Good friend of mine. We attend church together and he's the techie guy there at Risen Savior, always uh, sharing things that come across his desktop. And this one in particular has to do with Google and Google calendars specifically that you could use something in Google calendars called appointment slots. And this was the ability for people to go in and pick a time to meet with you maybe. Um, helpful for teachers around parent-teacher conference scheduling time or something like that. Well, Google has newness on the horizon, just like Google always does, and they're changing appointment slots. They're going to be grandfathering that in favor of something called appointment schedule, which has a nice new interface and uh, gives you the ability to kind of pad time so that you can have some extra time around your meetings. You don't just go back to back. Um, just a lot more variety in how you schedule it, where you don't have, you can say, I don't want any meetings on Tuesday, but every other day I want them from one to 5 PM or whatever it is. Um, you have to go in currently in your calendar settings to, to activate the appointment schedules. However, it says right there that this is going, appointment schedules are going to replace the appointment slots. So eventually you won't have a choice. So you may as well jump on the bandwagon now. And like I said, it has a nice new interface and a lot more flexibility as you're scheduling appointment slots and uh uh, time between and things like that. So um, Michael actually shared a video and we'll have uh, that video in our show notes as well. A really good walkthrough of how to turn on the options in your calendar settings and then how to make use of it. Um, it's from a YouTube channel called Mr. Campbell Rocks. So apparently uh, he's a teacher who shares information of this nature on YouTube. So check that out. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that update. That does look like a, a lot nicer, more elegant mm -hmm. solution. And uh, again, when we talked about it, I thought maybe this is the perfect application for um, teachers as they're setting up uh, meetings with, uh, with parents mm -hmm. and a lot of other different applications there. Mm hmm for sure. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to kind of circle back to something we talked about on the last show, Martin, because I, I missed a whole section of what I wanted to share. Um, in the moment, I skipped over a speaker that I wanted to talk about who was at the recent Christ in Media XR Festival. Um, I attended that a few weeks ago at Bethany Lutheran College, and the headliner speaker was a gal named Christine Lyon Bailey, and uh, she was just fabulous and really excited about the area of VR as well as esports. She kind of had experiences in both and not just experiences. She's actually written the book on both, um, a co-author of a book called Reality Bites, B-Y-T-E-S, about virtual reality and especially in relation to the classroom. And then another book that she co-authored called The Esports Education Playbook. So, um, she had interesting uh, real world experience. She's an educator in New Jersey public school system. She's actually a principal now, but kind of came up through the ranks um, doing different things and then became an administrator. And in her school, she almost differentiated her school and have people opting into her school because of their virtual reality um, options that are available up there as well as their esports team. So it's a, it's a K through eight kind of setting, I believe. So, uh, um, not high school level where they're doing esports and everything, even at a grade school level. And, um, she had really good experiences with it. She had recommendations on, um, the particular VR headset that they use. It's called an HTC Vive, and it's a little more pricey than the Oculus version from uh, Meta slash Facebook, uh, starting at about $800 and going up, but it has um, a lot better integration in a school setting and management software and things, uh, to make use of. She really emphasized, um, using VR um, to enhance education. She had several VR apps that she showed experiences from and how um, students had responded to them and things. But a couple that she made mention of, if you have VR headsets in your school and you aren't using them yet, Google Earth has a, an app called Wander um, where you can wander the earth and show them the world. Um, the blue was mentioned several times, um, not just by Christine, but by others as being a great uh, ocean 
app where you can be in the ocean and see see under the sea. Um, Speak to go allows you to just say something and you're there uh, virtually. And then just uh, the vr.youtube.com um, channel or space on YouTube that has um, virtual reality videos available. So those are just a few highlights from Christine. I just didn't want to let the moment pass. I, I overlook that in my notes last time I was talking about the XR Festival. So I wanted to be sure and make mention of the great stuff that she brought to the conference as well. Excellent. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yep. Thank you for attending that. Um, certainly as we talked about last time, uh, worthwhile um, and a lot of energy, you know, pumped into that. Uh, mm-hmm. So thanks for sharing Good your stuff. experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if people want to communicate with us, as uh, Michael and Phil did this uh, past week, it's easy enough to do. You can simply send us an email, wellstech at wells.net, or go to our show notes page, wellstech.wells.net, and across the top, all kinds of links there to the media, the social medias that uh, we frequent. And uh, we would love to, to hear your voice on any one of them or leave a, a comment on a particular show. We, we see those as well. Uh, or if you want to just send us a voicemail, there's a blue button on the right edge of the screen you can take advantage of. Uh, one encouragement that we would give you is if you are listening uh, through, let's say, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or something like that, Take some time, if you would, to leave a review, uh, hopefully a positive one. Uh, the more reviews we get, the more ratings we get, the, the more people likely to uh, stumble across uh, what we do here and uh, opportunities to share what we do as ministers uh, you know, that are trying to figure out what to, uh, to do with technology in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these times. So please take digital a age, digital yes. age. Yes. Uh, so please take the opportunity to do that. If, uh, if you're so inclined, uh, that's going to about do it for this week. We look forward to having you join us again. I think we uh, have some more interesting interviews lined up. So stay tuned for that. And uh, in the meantime, have a blessed week and uh, God bless. Bye-bye.